Well, hello, and welcome to the Intermountain West Shorebird Survey Training for participants here in Utah. On behalf of our entire partnership, we are so happy to have you on our team, whether it's your fourth survey with us or your first. I am Janice Gardner, the Executive Director here at Sageland Collaborative, and I fell in love with Great Salt Lake and its bird life when I moved here about 20 years ago. And I'm really honored to be a part of this work and this team. Uh, we're located in Salt Lake City, which is the home of your Great Salt Lake, a wetland of hemispheric importance, and the ancestral homeland of our Timpanogos, Eastern Shoshone, and Ute community members. With that, I'm going to hand it over to our project lead. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is M. Clark. I recently joined the team at Sageland Collaborative, and I am taking over Janice's um, past role as your main point of contact for the Shorebird Survey, um, working alongside Max and John. I'm very excited to be here. I fell in love with Shorebirds many years ago just from watching their amazing little behaviors, um, and I'm excited to be a part of this survey. I'll pass it over to Sierra. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sierra Hastings. I am the Communications and Development Specialist at Sage on Collaborative, and I am pretty new to birding. Um, I really fell in love with them because of Sage on Collaborative and the amazing people on our team who are so passionate. Good evening, everyone. My name is Max Malmquist, and I am the Engagement Manager for National Audubon Society Saving Lakes Program. And I am the lead coordinator for the regional portion of the Intermountain West Shorebird Surveys. And um, I fell in love with birds back in 2012 and really fell in love with shorebirds when I started working for Audubon back in 2018. And I'll pass it over to John. Hello, I'm John Neal, and I work with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources as a wildlife biologist uh, focusing on uh, water bird surveys around Great Salt Lake. And that's it. Thanks, John. Awesome. So in this training, we are going to cover how to conduct your surveys. And at the end, there will be an optional Q&A session. Um, on this webinar, you have been muted and your videos are turned off, but you are more than welcome to use the Q&A and chat features at the bottom of the screen there and communicate any questions with us or enthusiasm, and I will be moderating those. Great. Thank you so much, Sierra. So to start, I just wanted to give a brief background about shorebirds. As you may know, shorebirds embark on some of the longest annual migrations of any animal, let alone um, let alone birds on the planet. And they depend on those resources and habitat availability to sex successfully complete their journey. Unfortunately, shorebird populations have declined significantly in the last 40 years. Our threats include drought, loss of habitat, disturbance, and more. In fact, one third of shorebirds are considered tipping point species, which means that they have lost 70% of their cumulative population since 1980. Um, collaborative efforts and targeted research can help pinpoint where shorebirds are most strongly impacted so that conservation attention can be focused where it is most needed. And this is exactly where this project comes into play. So you've already helped us document where shorebirds are, and we use this information to best manage our wetlands for our precious shorebirds. So here are some results from our fall 2023 survey, which many of you participated in. And this map represents nearly 300,000 shorebirds that you helped us count. So the survey areas that are in green had the most shorebirds, purple, a little bit less shorebirds, and then the hatched areas had none. And we want to remind you that you are definitely a part of something very big. So this Utah team is comprised of over 100 people, but we've got hundreds of people across the region that are counting shorebirds at the very same time as you all. So the circles on this map represent where shorebirds were most abundant this past fall survey. Uh, and you can see that 
there are some pretty big numbers at Great Salt Lake. And in fact, in our the past three migration surveys we've done, Great Salt Lake has hosted half of the region's shorebirds. So it's a pretty big deal and we can't count birds like this without your help. Thanks. So let's take a look at some of our resources. So this is where you can access them in our different ways. So your team lead has been mailed the hard copies of all of this information. The website has all of the digital versions that you might need. And we also send you regular updates via our newsletters. Um, and don't, don't um, feel like you can't contact us. Please feel free to reach out to any of the project coordinators at any time if you have other questions. To go a little deeper, these are all the materials that each survey team has access to. So the Shorebird Survey Plan is the written version of this training. Then we have our three-page data form, which we'll go over later, your survey area map showing where you're going to be, and we also have a general access letter and vehicle placard to demonstrate you have permission to be where you are. And everyone on this project needs to sign Sage and Collaborators Volunteer Liability Form. If you haven't done so yet, Sierra is putting the link in the chat and it's also on our webpage and is included in our newsletters. Please take a moment to sign that as you need to do that before you can participate in the survey. Some of you are also surveying at waterfowl management areas and you'll be required to sign up through the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. They have moved to an online vol volunteer agreement this year. And if it's within your survey and you're supposed to sign up for it, I have already sent you an email with the link to do so. So you should already have that information. So feel free to, to take the time to do that. And then lastly, your team lead has been given a stamped envelope to return your data form and sketched up map to us after the survey. All right, so before we get into how to do your survey, I want to share with you all that safety really is our first priority. So in order to participate in this project, you do agree to work safely because, like I said, it's our number one concern. And we really do want you to stop surveying anytime there is some kind of concern for safety. A couple other big things is we don't want anyone to survey alone. So having a partner is mandatory. That's why uh, teams of three are great in case someone gets sick last minute, you still got a team of two. And just overall, really just watch out for each other. If on your survey, you see something unsafe, you know, let your field partners know. And lastly, just in addition to your physical safety, we actually care very deeply about everyone's well-being. So we ask everyone to treat each other's unique perspectives and identities with a lot of respect. If you've got any questions about our culture of inclusion, just reach out to us personally or through our webpage. And then um, a couple other big things are just for health and safety is just to um, remember communication. Always let people uh, know where you're going to be and what time you're gonna get back. We will be checking in with everyone on the big day and vehicle breakdowns and accidents can happen. So make sure that you've got the necessary supplies in your vehicle. Um, another big thing is that the temperatures may vary significantly. So we recommend dressing in layers and wear shoes that can get muddy or wet. And a big one is that bathrooms will not be readily available. So plan ahead. And our survey plan has pages of safety documents, including some tips about using bathrooms in the field. Um, and if you've got any questions, of course, you know who to reach out to. And this next slide, some of you have seen before, but it's a good one. And it's one of our amazing state biologist, Jason, and this is on a particularly bad day at work. And the point of us showing this is that many of the dirt roads that some of you are going to be traveling on are not actually roads. They're earthen dikes, which don't contain the typical like road base and rocks that roads do. So they can be very, very squishy. So be extremely conservative about what you drive on. It is totally okay to not survey an area because you can't access it. And we'll talk about how to report that. And just another note, if that you do get stuck, many sites are very remote and it's hard to communicate uh, that you need help. And we also don't wanna burden our land managers with trying to come rescue. They're very busy people. So don't make Jason mad by getting your car stuck on his roads. 
All right, we're gonna launch a short poll. This is a really easy quiz. Uh, Sierra is gonna launch this poll, but it's, it's a two-parter. Is safety our priority? Your choices are yes or no. Safety is not our priority in that everything goes out the window when it comes to counting shorebirds, especially if you see a rare one. So for our folks that are on the live training, feel free to give a click. And we'll keep this poll open for just another few seconds. Sierra, did people do well? Or do we have any, any funny people out there that think the answer was B? You know, we have one comedian in the crowd today. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so thanks everyone. Again, we appreciate you um, helping us uh, with our culture of safety. All right, let's talk about the basics of the survey. So in the event of severe rain or really muddy roads, we're going to reschedule our survey. We will send you email newsletters that have updates in the days prior, and we'll also post the information on the website so you'll be updated of the survey status. If you haven't been to your survey before, let us know if you want to review the route virtually via Zoom, or if you want to go scout the area beforehand. This requires additional permission, so please contact me directly if your team would like to scout in the days before the actual survey date. You should have already have been provided, your team lead will have received the keys and gate permits or, or gate codes required to enter your sites. Let us know if you have any questions or concerns in ac accessing those. So for a note on our observers, just because we assigned one person as the team lead, that doesn't mean that they are doing everything. There are several tasks and you can split them up. So there's counting actual birds, someone should be the recorder on the data form, and it would be great to have a navigator. Also, we recommend starting the survey near sunrise so you have time to complete your route and you don't get much too, too much glare from any sun on the water. There are tips on how to travel your survey area in the survey plan, and your survey area likely already has a route designated in which you're only surveying in one direction. Please remember we've been granted special permission to access these sites. Treat the lands, the people, and the wildlife with respect. And while birds shouldn't be nesting at this time, please be mindful. Also, please do not bring your pets on the survey, even though they're very cute. Now we're just gonna take a look at our equipment checklist. We've highlighted a few things in red that you might not think are, are key to take with you. But in addition to the bird watching supplies, we wanna make sure that you've prepared for the worst. Uh, and this is just so again, you can stay safe. So if you do get stuck and you're out there for a while, we wanna make sure that you have enough warm clothes or cold clothes and that you have enough food so that you can um, wait it out. Now we're gonna jump into the survey. So here's the paper maps that your team lead will be provided showing your survey area. The survey area is centered on the map and we've, it's been delimited by a yellow line. It also contains in this example, the route of the driving portion of the survey. And just because that you're doing a, a vehicle survey doesn't mean that you shouldn't get out of your car. Please stop and get out of the car whenever you want to stop and count the shorebirds. Some of the maps have marks showing specific sites that past surveyors have found really helpful as good places to stop and count birds. Now let's take a closer look. So the highlighted area is the survey area and you are only counting birds inside this yellow highlighted area. On the other side of your survey area, what's been highlighted in blue on this map are the other survey areas. So your peers are counting birds in these areas. So for this example, as you're driving into the site, you see all these cute shorebirds, but these are the ones that we've highlighted in red. Those are not in your survey area, so please don't include them on your data sheet. However, when you get in and all the birds that we've highlighted in green within your survey boundaries, please do count those. Those are in your survey area. All right, Em, thanks for giving us your primer on that. And in addition to those paper maps, we have navigation tools that you can use for your smartphone. 
And the directions are also in your survey plan. And I'm just going to review how to, to do the most user-friendly options here. So step one is to find the app store on your smartphone and download the free ArcGIS field maps from Esri. You can also find this app using the QR code that's on the screen. Go ahead, you can get your phones out now. And the same QR code is also in your survey plan. So step two is to open the app in your smartphone. And please note that you actually do not need to create an account. No login is required for this. Step three is to use the search bar in the app and type in Utah Shorebird Survey. Our project will show up right there on the list. And an important note is if you participated in the survey before, you may have downloaded an older version of the project and we have disabled those older maps, but just make sure that you've selected Utah Shorebird Survey. And now on to step four is to use the map to zoom around in and out and to find where your survey area is. Make sure that you allow the app to use your location so that you can see exactly where you are in relation to your survey area. And this works great if you have cell phone service. And most of our sites do have cell phone service. However, some don't. Or if you're like me, you always kind of love to have that backup plan. So to get the backup plan is step five, is that if you click on the three small dot menu there, um, you can add an offline area and you can create your own custom map of your survey area, or you can even do something easier. And you can see that there is a list of preset map areas that cover all of our survey areas and they're just ready to download. So in this example, if your survey area is in the Northern part of Great Salt Lake, you can just download the Great Salt Lake North map. And we really encourage you to download this app and play around with it as soon as possible. You, you can't break it, so give it a try. And if you've got any questions, of course, we're here to help. This app is a huge asset, and so we hope you find it useful. Great, thanks, Janice. So I wanted to do a little poll to check in to see if you guys have been reading our newsletters. So we're just gonna do a check-in to see what birds are we counting this year. So your options are A, shorebirds only, B, shorebirds and white-faced ibis, or C, all birds encountered on the survey. So take a minute and let us know what you think. How are our results looking, Sierra? We've got about 10 more people. I imagine some people might be going back to their newsletters to see what we were talking about. Yeah. Give it just a couple of seconds here. All right. Looks like most people are reading our newsletters. Okay, good to know. So this year, We've actually are changing things up. So we're throwing you a curve bill by adding a new bird. And this is the white faced ibis to our counts. And while this shares many habitats with and has many similar foraging behaviors as other shorebirds, it's actually not. It's a wading bird. So why are we doing this? Well, this is one a really important species for Utah. It is actually considered a Utah species of greatest conservation need. But um, more importantly, the Great Salt Lake area wetlands host some of the largest nesting colonies in the world. And then it's really important that we know what's going on with them because there's been some recent population declines detected. So while we were out surveying shorebirds, we decided that we'd add the white-faced ibis because it's really an easy bird to identify with its long decurved bill. And that way we can help track how these birds are using the habitat at different times so that we can help direct our conservation efforts. Okay, so now you've navigated to your site and you're ready to start the survey. So first you wanna get out your data form. Again, these are the three page uh, document that you would have a paper copy of. And so we are on the top portion of the first page. And this is where you enter in your basic information, but it's also really important that we make sure we know that your survey area name, the date, your survey start time, and the names of your survey team. 
You can add the total number of participants in the checklist. You need to ensure you've attended all of our trainings, you reviewed your safety measures, and everyone has signed the volunteer forms. You can check your primary survey method. For most of us, we're either walking or driving. So now it's time to count shorebirds and white-faced ibis. So now we're looking at page two of our data form. So you're going to record all the species that you encounter that are shorebirds or white-faced ibis within your survey area. Please do your best to identify the shorebirds to their species. However, they're super hard and they're often really far away. And so if you can't figure out what species it is, do your best to identify them down to a group. In the survey plan, we have a whole list of the different group options you can use to record the different birds. So even us experts can't necessarily identify every small sandpiper that we see, and you can label those peeps. You can tally the shorebirds however you want that makes sense to you. Another note is that we're only counting shorebirds that are using or have landed in your survey area. So shorebirds flying over are called flyovers and are not to be counted. In the unlikely event that you don't have any shorebirds in your survey area, don't fret because this is actually really important too. It shows us where and where the birds are not using habitat. So we still want you to record zero birds. I wanted to take a time, a note to um, mention that we have a lot of cryptic species in addition to some really cool flashy species like the American avocets or the black neck stilts. Some birds, like our snowy plover here, are really good at blending into their habitat. In addition, their foraging behavior, they use a, a technique called sort of like stop and pause where they're running and looking for an invertebrate with their big eyes and then they'll peck down at it. So they might be paused when you happen to glance by them and you might miss them. So make sure you're taking the time to really scan through the whole area don't go fast. Make sure you have the time to see if there's any birds that actually are roosting rather than foraging in plain sight or really cryptic like our small friend here. All right, now we're going to get into a little bit more testing of your skills. So I mentioned the flyovers in a previous slide. So let's make sure we, sure we know what that means. So what about this flock of American avocets passing by high overhead? Are these flyovers? So we're gonna launch another poll. So A, these birds are using the survey area and I should count them. Or B, they are just passing through. Sorry, correct. Um, let's see how the poll's going. Give it just a couple more seconds here. All right, looks like most people, most people know. Great, so yes, these birds were flying uh, high overhead and didn't stop in our survey area. So these are considered flyovers and we don't count them. Now we're gonna jump to a little bit of a trickier one. So in this harder example, I observed this wimbrel taking off from the shore. Is this a flyover? So provide your thoughts here. So we're gonna launch our next poll. So we, yes, it's flying or B, no, this bird just flushed. It was using the habitat, so it's not a flyover. Looks like the votes are in. Wow, amazing, everybody agreed. This is not a flyover because it's using the habitat. That's awesome. All right, now I'm gonna pass it back to Janice. All right, now let's talk about how to count flocks of shorebirds. And this is really hard even for professionals. So how many sanderlings are there here? Tricky, right? Do you wanna pop over to the next slide, M? We can use the blocking method to help us count flocks of birds. And so here, I'm just gonna count out like clusters of 10 birds and then visually block those clusters. So five clusters of about 10 birds equals roughly 50 sanderlings. So how did we do? What's the actual number here? 53, not so bad. 
Let's try something a little harder now. Does this image give anyone anxiety? Well, it gives me anxiety too, so that's okay. Practice makes perfect. But I'm gonna show you how to count a flock like this. Um, first, I'm gonna be looking at the entire flock and I see that there's a lot of large shorebirds on this wooden dock and maybe there's a few medium smaller ones in there. So I've established that I have a flock of mostly large shorebirds and I'm gonna start blocking off groups of 10. Um, you know, you can always use different numbers too, groups of 20. Sometimes you need to use blocks of 100, like if you're counting phalaropes. And I visually block these off of mostly large shorebirds and I come up with about 11 clusters of 10 birds. So that gives me an estimate of about 110 shorebirds. So if these birds fly away, at least I know I had a flock of 110 large shorebirds that I could record. That's great. But these birds seem like they're hunkered down and are being cooperative. So let's see if we can identify them. Uh, these lighter brown birds are willets in their non-breeding plumage. And these orange speckled ones are uh, marbled godwits. So I do a scan and I notice there are a few of these medium-sized shorebirds, which honestly, including Max and John on this call, we can't tell if they're dowitchers or stilt sandpipers. So we're gonna be happy with just calling those medium-sized shorebirds. And then from there, I'm not gonna try and count them, but just get a general proportion. So I think about three quarters of them are willets, which means the remaining quarter are split between the godwits and these medium-sized shorebirds. And you can just do the simple math here, um, which hopefully someone on your survey team remembers how to translate your portions into actual bird numbers and remember your cell phones, I'll have calculators on them. And that gives us um, about five medium-sized shorebirds, 22 godwits, 83 willets. And you can put those tallies on your data sheets. And if you'd like to practice these skills, there's a lot of great resources online. Um, hopefully Sierra can uh, put a great, great one in the chat. There it is, lycobirds.com has some really good quizzes. And so I encourage you to do that. Great, now that you're sure how to record the different shorebirds, we're gonna take a look at our last um, page of our data form. So this is a general notes page and you can use it to record your observations, any logistical issues you came across that you want us to know about. And you can put your tallies here as well. If you're an expert birder and you wanted to record other bird species, feel free to do so in this space, but please just to keep in mind that our priority is the shorebirds and the white faced ibis count. So please make sure you're taking the time to do those properly first. So now that you've completed your survey, we're gonna estimate the visual percent of your survey area. So this is how much of your survey area you could actually see and count the birds on. So in our first example, the survey team was able to follow their route in the survey area and they had a pretty good eye on where everything was, except this little bit in the top left corner. So you would take a pen or pencil and you would visually, um, you can shade in that visual area. In this example, our survey team was only able to access the roads in the southern portion because they were too muddy and they didn't want to get stuck. They used their spotting scopes and were still able to see a good portion of the survey. So you just shade in that area. This information will help us understand the true number of birds per survey area and also help us refine the survey areas on this project if needed. Okay, so now we're circling back to page one of our data form. At the end of your survey, please log the hours and the mileage from everyone on your team. This includes all the travel from your individual homes. We track your contributions of time and vehicle mileage and we use them as in-kind donations on grants that support this project. So thank you for doing that. Please record the wind, the cloud cover, any precipitation as an average of what you experienced during the entire survey. Then we ask you to describe the dominant cover types of your survey area. All the cover type categories are in the survey plan, but I will highlight our most common ones in Utah on the next slide. But first, don't forget the last data field is the visible percent of the survey area and you can use your sketched up map that you just completed to come up with that estimate. So in Utah, our common cover types are natural wetlands in which 
Water naturally flows through the site. Managed wetlands are wetlands where water is managed by dike rows and culverts. If you see any water control structures, you can mark this cover type. And then some of you will be serving on the edges of the Great Salt Lake, and that is saline lake habitat. If you have any questions on this, just reach out during or after your survey or write notes on that third page of your data form, and we'll make sure that you got it right. Finally, the last step. We have a checklist on page one of your data form. When you started your survey, you already confirmed that you took this training, you reviewed the safety measures, you signed the liability forms. Do a final sweep and make sure you have filled out all the fields on your data form. Then please have someone on your team take photos of all three pages and then email them to me, M, at emily at sagelandcollaborative.org. And please include your the area the survey area name and your subject line so I know who this is coming from. And why is this important? Well, for two reasons. One, it's gonna serve as a safety check so we can make sure that you guys have completed your survey and are on your way home. And if, you do, if we don't hear from you, we'll be calling to check in and make sure everybody's okay. Then with their team leads, they were mailed a stamped envelope. So please mail those paper, data forms as well as that sketched up survey map back up to us so that we can have the original copies. All right, so we love hearing your stories and we would love for you to share those stories and your experience on the survey with us, either on social media um, by using the hashtag ShorebirdsCount or by emailing them directly to me, Sierra at stagelandcollaborative.org. Or if you were here with us last year, uh, we had a great Google form where you could submit any photos or videos and that allows us to share them on our communications. Um, these stories really help us promote shorebirds and the importance of them in our communities. So we are just so grateful for anything that you're willing to share. All right, so you've probably noticed that this training has been heavily focused on how to do the survey. And we have posted a number of resources in the survey plan and our website so you can practice and brush up on your shorebird ID. And with that, you, you have made it to this point and you are now officially trained on the Intermountain West Shorebird Survey. 